Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Susan Harley. I'm the Michigan Policy Director for Clean Water Action. We're part of a coalition or a campaign called Protect Michigan Waters from Fracking. And I'm going to go into some of the things that uh, we're concerned about and uh, hope that you share our concerns. I know we just got a really great presentation from the DEQ. Um, but I'll have some additional information to add to his presentation. The first thing um, I like to start off with a statement of value, and that is that our water is invaluable. Uh, really, truly, we are defined by water here in Michigan, not just the physical shape of our state, but also our Great Lakes way of life. I think everyone here has a personal connection with waterways, with a lake, with a river, uh, with you know cottages or boating. Um, I think that that is very key to our Michigan way of life. Another thing to keep in mind is that the Great Lakes do represent 20% of the usable surface water. Getting some feedback. <laughs> Uh, of the usable fresh water in the world. So that's a huge responsibility for our state, and we at Clean Water Action do not take that responsibility lightly. Um, even though water is invaluable, I think we can put some dollar signs to the water. Um, just listed here are a couple of the ways that we are already using our water. Uh, that is huge economic benefit to our state. Um, the first is tourism over $17 billion per year for tourism. And most of the people who come to Michigan come for the Great Lakes, come for all of the water recreation opportunities that we have here. Also agriculture, as you know, we're one of the leading states in the nation for production of agricultural commodities. And that, of course, relies on fresh water. We couldn't have the farming industry that we have here in the state without that invaluable water. And lastly, fishing here in the state also is quite a large industry, over two billion in commercial and recreational fishing alone. Oh. Okay, good, maybe this will <laughs> fix the feedback problem. Uh, a little harder to look at my slides, but I uh, know most of the stuff up there. So I also like to talk about some legal protections that we have for our water here. I think one of the first things that we should talk about is a concept called public trust. It's been around since ancient, ancient times. The Romans had this concept that we couldn't own water. It's essential for life, therefore one person cannot have ownership over that and therefore take it away for the uses of not just current uh, users of water but also future generations who will rely on that water for life. Um, in addition, we here in Michigan have constitutional protections for our environment. It was one of the first environmental laws put in place in the nation. It's been uh, replicated by the U.S. government and uh, also other states, but it is the Michigan Environmental Protection Act or MEPA. So I know we just heard quite a lot about what fracking is, so I don't want to go too much into detail, but um, I would just state that the, the fracking that's um, happening now, that is coming into Michigan for the most part, um, as we talked about in the upper part of the Lower Peninsula, is a new type of fracking that hasn't been done before. So not only is the depth greater, goes as far down as 10,000 feet, but also the quantity of water then is much higher. Um, we heard around five million gallons used per well. That's a hundred times what was used in the uh, traditional type of well that was working in the Antrim Shale. Um, we also heard about the fact that chemicals make up this fracking fluid that's used to break apart the rock. It's a small portion of the overall mix, but these are toxic chemicals. Um, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, chemicals like formaldehyde, like benzene, like sulfuric acid, things that um, in tiny, tiny quantities, if exposed um, humans, can become deathly ill. Um, in fact, back in uh, 2011, there was a congressional report that said of all of the chemicals used, there's around 750 that they're aware of, 29 of those chemicals are either carcinogenic or pose other human health risks. 
Um, also, we know that wastewater doesn't all come up, even though um, you know, it is produced, it is shipped off and then injected into underground wells, uh, up to 70% of that water could remain underground. And it's not really known how long it will stay in its formations, whether or not it would migrate, uh, what will happen 100 years from now when that cement uh, casing has crumbled. As we know, bridges can crumble after a number of years. So we don't frankly know how long our infrastructure will hold up um, moving forward. Um, this is just an overview of that congressional report that I highlighted um, with the 29 chemicals that do pose uh, human health risks, including carcin um, carcinogens. Pretty scary stuff. <laughs> um, this, I, you just saw this map, but this is the new permits that are going in up north in Michigan for the deep horizontal hydraulic fracturing. Uh, as he mentioned, over 21 permits have been issued with several dozen more pending. Um, can see that it's up, you know, the tip of the mitt area, Sheboygan, Antrim, uh, Mississauga counties. So um, different than what would be happening here, um, just given the depth of the shale formation. But many of the things about the fracking process are the same. There's still chemicals used. There's still trucks that come to the area. There's still uh, the habitat fragmentation and, and other associated risks that come along with the fracking that's happening up north. Something to give a big picture view is that uh, though the state has a number of regulations, there is really a lack of federal oversight. Uh, one of the things that um, has been really publicized in the press is called the Halliburton loophole. It is, uh, <laughs> it is an exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act for fracking. Um, that exemption did not cover fracking operations that use diesel fuel. Um, which many of them actually are pumping diesel fuel under the ground as well. Um, but for the most part, they have this wide exemption that has allowed them to move forward um, really unchecked uh, in some states. So Michigan, again, has a strong regulatory framework that needs to be improved, but some states had nothing in place. And so this lack of the federal oversight is a real problem. So. Uh, many in Congress are attempt, attempting to rectify this. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation is called the FRAC Act, which would remove that exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Additionally, the EPA is currently undergoing a multi-year study of fracking, um, really re-looking at the risks and understanding that um, the reality in many of the states where it's happening is that there are environmental impacts and so they wanted to reassess the entire process so um, this is currently happening and so they have some um, initial findings that are kind of trickling out of the agency but we're still waiting for their final report Susan? yes Yes. And there are, the EPA is actually doing guidance for that right now. Um, so through the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, they are going through exactly what type of wells would they need, et cetera. So they are recognizing that diesel fuel was used um, far more frequently than they thought it was being used. Um, so we heard a lot about the state regulations. We feel that they're still outdated for this new type of horizontal hydraulic fracturing that's been going in. So um, we really feel that we need to relook at these regulations, make sure that we've examined all the potential risks and all the ways that those risks should be addressed by the state. Um, so you know, we heard a few of the tweaks that have happened, but I'm going to go into depth on those issues that we feel still need to be addressed by the state. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> so the first thing I'd like to talk about is overuse of water. So we did hear um, that the DEQ is concerned with that, rightly so. We did join with other Great Lakes states in the Great Lakes Compact, which was a multi-state agreement limiting the amount of water that we could uh, divert or take away from our Great Lakes Basin. 
Um, to implement that Great Lakes Compact, we did have some water withdrawal legislation, the most recent being in 2008. Uh, the uh, oil and gas industry received an exemption from those water withdrawal laws. So they haven't been required to follow that for a really long time. Uh, once environmental groups and other concerned citizens started getting involved in this, we did see a number of um, tweaks or small changes to the regulatory regime at the state. Uh, one of those was use of the water withdrawal assessment tool. That's a scientific modeling tool that we heard a little bit about that uh, you kind of put your numbers in for how much water you plan to use and it turns those numbers and says whether or not there's going to be an adverse impact on the resource. However, uh, even if they're using that water withdrawal tool, these oil and gas companies are not registering their use. So they're just looking at a tool, taking the water out, and not uh, subtracting that amount of water from what's considered to be available in the state. So they're not really using the tool. The tool, in fact, is becoming more and more inaccurate every time a company, a large water user, withdraws that water without making that uh, registered water reduction within the tool itself. So uh, the department recognizes that's a problem. The tool would actually need to be uh, changed. Some of the programming would need to be changed, but at the same time, it's a very easy fix. So if they are requiring them to look at the tool, they should also be required to register their use. Another problem is that the Department of Environmental Quality Water Resources Division is extraordinarily short-staffed. They have around two people on staff right now to deal with all the water conflicts that are happening in the state, including um, Southwest Michigan has a lot of agricultural conflicts of water use. They have a lot of large water users that are drawing too much or you know, not too much under their permit, but so much as it's having an impact on the water use of their neighbors. So a good portion of the department's time is spent negotiating these conflicts that have occurred um, already from, from existing water users. They haven't even really become able to uh, look at these potential conflicts of the large water users that are new users coming into the system. Uh, we also think that there's a huge risk of water pollution in Michigan. I know we heard um, you know, some of the possibilities, but I think what's important to understand is that even though we have these standards on the book as, as far as how far the casing should go down, what kind of cement should be used, there can always be faulty construction. I mean, these are humans putting these wells in, um, and also the materials that they are using are not um, you know, forever type of things, concrete does crumble. And so I think to understand that these may be, you know, really uh, solid structures now, we just don't know how long that will stay, uh, the integrity of those will stay moving forward into the future. Um, something that did happen recently in 2011, there was faulty well construction at an Antrim well in Benzie County and there was um, some amount of material released um, at the wellhead and the DEQ is still kind of processing and determining um, if there was any environmental impact from that spill. We've also heard that um, you know, the state has this really good track record, but what's coming out across the nation is that in many instances when companies have had problems with private landowners, they've entered into court settlements that have confidentiality clauses. In so many instances, this is not public information. This is a, a, a legal proceeding between two parties that is not publicized. And so, uh, you know, so that's one of the things that's kind of coming to light and some of these reports have been buried and so um, now in other states they're finding these um, you know understandings that the the state had that there was some contamination but it was you know monetarily settled um, you know we haven't you know done that full analysis here in the state to see whether or not um, you know, if we dug deep enough, we could find some of these buried reports, but I think that there's uh, plenty of people who are going to start working on that. 
One of the things that we did here is that the state now, um, as of uh, recently, has partial chemical disclosure. They use something called a material safety data sheet, which is a requirement of a federal law, the um, Emergency Planning and Right to Know Act, or EPCRA, and that law requires posting of material safety data sheets. Now that federal law only applies to chemicals that are stored in quantities of only 10, of 10,000 pounds or greater. So the state doesn't really know of what percentage of chemicals used right now in fracking processes, how many that would have a requirement for an MSDS sheet right now. Is that 2% of all the chemicals used, 80%? They just don't know. So right now we just have those for the chemicals that are over 10,000 pounds. And as mentioned, right now companies are able to say, proprietary trade secret and not uh, release or disclose that information to the state. The state doesn't ask for proof of that, but the state um, is allowing them to redact that information or um, not disclose that information. We don't believe that that's enough. We believe that the state needs to know all of those proprietary chemicals. <laughs> so. <laughs> So some of the other things that we're um, looking at are setbacks, how far are these wells able to go in um, from a natural uh, resource like a stream. So right now they have only 300 foot buffer between a well and a river or um, you know, a little bit bigger than that for a home or a school. But still, we need to you know, have a conversation here at the state whether or not we believe that's protective enough for our important resources. We've also looked at some of the management practices that, um, that we heard about earlier such as secondary containment or that liner um, around, around the site and is that liner enough? Do they have enough buffers? We don't have the answers but I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. We're also concerned about air pollution and other types of environmental impacts that we could see, such as habitat fragmentation or um, impacts on endangered or threatened species. Um, something to know is the EPA is moving forward with air pollution rules right now that will limit the release of uh, volat <laughs> volatile organic compounds or VOCs. You can tell I'm used to just speaking in acronyms. Um, but they will reduce those by 25% moving forward. A lot of that is reduction in venting or allowing methane to be flared at the site, which um, not only wastes gas, but also releases air pollution. Something else, um, you know, we heard about the hydrogen sulfide accident that happened this past Christmas Eve. Um, though it's not from the fracking operation itself, we believe all of these need to be looked at holistically because they are part of the process. Even though it may not have come from the actual extraction, it is uh, you know, something that happens because of the entire process of extraction. So they have to separate the gases, they have to dispose of the gases, they have to dispose of the, uh, the waste liquids. We, those need to be uh, contained in the definition. So we are definitely one of those organizations that has a, a very broad view of what is um, you know, contained in, in the word fracking. Um, I know that we heard about trucking um, impacts and, and I think that one thing that most people in this audience don't know is that diesel exhaust is highly toxic. It poses three times the lifetime cancer risk than all other air toxics combined. And so even though uh, you know, we're around diesel engines all the time, we don't realize that they're increasing our cancer rates, they're causing asthma, they're causing heart attack and stroke. So, uh, Clean Water Action does work a lot on the diesel issue and educating folks on the fact that uh, diesel is highly toxic. But the fact is a lot of these areas are very rural and uh, they don't have that much traffic. But um, you know, fracking means a lot of trucks, hundreds and hundreds of trucks coming into these areas, leaving these areas, uh, bringing the chemicals, bringing the water. And so, um, you know, 
places that normally have very good air quality have seen dangerous spikes in air pollution because uh, it really is an industrial site that's going in as far as the the natural gas extraction. It's, um, it's something that you know, other states have seen major air quality reductions. So um, two states where we hear a lot about issues are Pennsylvania and Wyoming. It's true their states um, do have different regulations, but I think it's also true that these are areas that have seen impacts, and so if we don't take that as um, you know, something that we need to heed or an example that we need to look at, uh, we could be in the same position that they are in, which is trying to fix the problem. So Pennsylvania, um, a, a place called Dimmick, is one of the most publicized areas of contamination. The movie Gasland is really based upon a uh, Pennsylvania uh, resident and um, his being approached by a natural gas company to lease his land and, and uh, or lease his mineral rights. And so the process of discovery he goes through. And so, um, but Dimmick is still in the news. They have um, recently gone through a really large EPA examination of the environmental impacts that they're seeing in their community and uh, they've seen really high levels of methane in their water uh, which even though there's not a drinking water standard for that it's not healthy to drink and so I think what's going to happen out of this is definitely our drinking water standards are going to have to change uh, to really address some of those those other contaminants that we're seeing. Wyoming is also one of the most recent um, areas where there is actually been the link fade from fracking to water contamination. It's still considered only a likely link, but I think that that's the EPA stepping up and being willing to uh, take, take a public stand against the very strong companies and industries that are uh, promoting natural gas extraction. And so this, uh, this study is really, really important, and I know all eyes are on that area of the country, but it is really one of the first places where they've, they've been able to show that causal link that's so important in, in, in the law. Um, and so that's something that we'll, we're keeping our eyes on as well. This is a really huge concern for us as well. So um, as we heard, after the frack water that's polluted with chemicals comes back to the earth, it's then shipped to a deep injection well where it is then blasted down beneath our earth. and. Um, supposedly stays there forever. So I don't know that we know uh, how long that forever will be, and that's another issue. But um, definitely is a problem for states like Ohio and Arkansas. So what's happening in Ohio is the uh, the influx and volume of frac fluid that's being injected has led to earthquakes in areas that didn't ever have seismic activity before are now having a pretty sizable earthquakes. Um, and Ohio is really the repository for other states' waste. Over 50% over of the frac fluid that they are disposing of is coming from out of their state. So Michigan is already being courted as the next great geologic disposal area for the rest of the nation's frac fluid. Something else that we're highly concerned with is the cloak of confidentiality and secrecy that really surrounds this entire industry. Uh, you know, our organization was built on opening up the, the, the curtain and shining sunlight onto our environmental regulations, getting the grassroots and the public involved in that. So we really feel that this is a key change that needs to happen at the state level. And that is a notice and comment period for the average citizen to have a say if one of these wells are coming into the community. So even if it's not your mineral rights, you still have have a right because it's still your freshwater aquifer that's at risk and so we believe that you should have the opportunity to put those comments into the DEQ. 
There are other issues at play. If you don't want to sell your mineral rights, it can still be compulsorily pooled with your neighbors. So even you know, if you want to, to keep those tight to you, that doesn't matter. They believe that they need to um, you know, have an effective use of this resource. And so um, if five of your neighbors have sold and you're the one holding out, I mean, I, I'm not sure if it's five. I actually don't know what the number is. I think it's ba based on uh, the site and the company wants to apply for it. And so they make the determination if enough people have sold around you and you haven't sold, they can uh, have an order for compulsory pooling and there will be a hearing and uh, they will take away your mineral rights and they'll give you money for it, but you will no longer have control on whether or not the stuff is extracted under the earth. Another thing to keep in mind is that there has been leasing fraud. So Michigan has been in the national media because of the Chesapeake Energy Company's creation of a shell company um, called Northern Exploration that did uh, fail to honor a good number of the leases that they signed. So it was a shell company, and so Chesapeake was then insulated from legal recourse. Um, you know, that shell company just went bankrupt, but Chesapeake has yet to be sued for the money that those people feel that they're owed for signing those leases. So I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, legal battle moving forward. So what are we doing about it? We are an advocacy organization. We're working for a package of le legislation um, here in Michigan. So uh, what we're doing is we're calling for pushing the pause button, um, also known as a moratorium, but we'd like to stop issuing permits until we understand what the risks are here in the state. Uh, so in, in addition to that pause, we would require a study of all of the risks, the risks to human health, the risks to water, um, the health of our waterways, to the amount and quantity of water in the state, to air pollution, to habitat. Um, so it's a really comprehensive study, and we, um, we feel that no permit should be issued until that, that complete study has been done. In addition, we want to remove the exemption for oil and gas companies from our water withdrawal laws so they are treated the same as other large water users. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we think is really important is kind of flipping the legal battle. And right now, if you feel that you have contamination, you have to hire the lawyer, hire the expensive experts that can then prove that it was the company that caused that contamination. This bill, um, House Bill 4736, would require the company to prove that it wasn't them. So they then have the presumption of liability that they were the ones who caused the issue. And so it just makes it a lot easier for the average citizen to, to have a claim uh, be successfully litigated. And lastly, this is uh, very exciting. This just happened last week. That is introduction of House Bill 5565, which requires full chemical disclosure prior to the state issuing a permit. So under this uh, legislation, a uh, fracking company would need to list all of the chemicals that they plan to use, even if they're proprietary trade secrets. Um, those that are proven to be trade secrets would be held confidential by the state, but everything else would be made public. They would have the information they need, full um, chemical abstract service numbers, concentrations as per you know, the total volume, so really all of the information they need. And that's really important for baseline testing, because if you do want to get your water tested, you need to know what to test for. Water testing is really, really expensive and it doesn't test for every single chemical under the um, under the sun so you really need to have a list of what's going to be going in in your community so you can get your water tested even better make the company test but um, I think I think anyway this provides really important information some of the other things that are unique about this uh, bill that would really lead the nation is that if a chemical has an alternative that is less harmful to public health, the state could not issue the permit. So they would have to use the least harmful chemicals. So again, really important um, you know, 
change that we feel needs to happen at the state level. Lastly, I would just want you all to get involved. And so I know we heard that um, the more people are looking at this issue, the more people understand about the issue, the more change we'll see, the better protections we'll see at the state level. And so uh, again, we do have a campaign, the Protect Michigan Waters from Fracking campaign. Um, would love to get you involved in that. So let me know if you um, are interested in that and I can uh, get you involved in the fight.